All right, let's get started. Welcome to CS 2050. Uh, the topic of the second half is going to be applications of finite probability and also uh, payoff probability. So I'm going to give you three interesting applications of probability theory that may surprise you. Um, so uh, we talked about, you know, you flip a random coin. Uh, everyone sort of agrees that the coin is, 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 is uniformly random. Uh, given a coin, your set of outcomes are H and T for heads and tails, such that the probability of these occurring is 1 half and 1 half, right? Um, but suppose you had a biased coin. So a biased coin has probability of heads occurring of some number P, and then therefore the probability of tails occurring is going to be what? Let's say p is some number between uh, 0 and 1 half, right? It's a biased coin. If a heads occurs with probability t p, what's the probability that tails occurs? 1 minus p. 1 minus p, right? And you may think every coin is perhaps implicitly biased. We just don't know how much. And there is some deep theory about, like, is the coin really random if it's determined by uh, physical... Uh, deterministic functions that are not random. You know, the equations of motions of a coin are deterministic. There's no random variable in a coin in a, in when you plot it. But extracting the determinism out of that is, is computationally too difficult. So it might as well look random to us in some sense. Maybe the coin is biased. Maybe P is just 0.49. Uh, Maybe it's one third and two thirds, whatever it is. But you, you could say, let's suppose you have a biased coin. It turns out if you have a biased coin, you can still extract from bias randomness, you have the ability to extract true randomness. So given biased randomness, you can extract, ran you can extra extract unbiased randomness. This is called a von Neumann extractor. Von Neumann, I think, appeared in the, that new Oppenheimer movie, right? Von Neumann was everywhere in computer science and quantum physics and things. Von Neumann extractor, basically, he sums, he, 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 even if the coin is biased, and especially if you don't know the coin is biased, you can set up a certain game of certain rules such that uh, you're guaranteed to have unbiased randomness. Let's say uh, that in, you, have, you want two possible outcomes, right? Um, but you don't know if they're biased or not. So you can't just say flip the coin and then that's that's my first outcome, and that's my second outcome. Instead, you set things up this way. Um, uh, flip, repeatedly flip the coin. Your biased coin, OK? If uh, heads, then tails, uh, player one wins. <coughs> if tails, then heads, player two wins. If heads, heads, or tails, tails, start over. <coughs> so why does this work? So he's basically saying repeatedly flip the coin. Now, if you, get, if you, if you ever get heads, or heads, tails, the first player wins. If you ever get tails, heads, the second player wins. And if you ever get heads, heads, or tails, tails, you just start over. You know, Not best two out of three or anything. You just genuinely, the whole experiment starts over. Why does this work? What is the probability? of a biased coin of heads, tails. Biased coin. What is the probability you get tails, heads? One minus p times p. Those are equal, one minus p times p is equal to p times 1 minus p by simple commutativity multiplication. So given a bad random coin, you can extract from it good randomness. Now, in fact, you can even say something stronger. You could, it's not necessarily true that p times 1 minus p is equal to 1 half. But it depends on how much randomness you can extract from a coin depends on how bad it is, how unrandom it is. Let's suppose uh, that the coin was deterministic. Suppose that the probability of heads was 1 and the probability of tails was 0. Let's say you have no randomness, zero randomness. You are deterministic. The, if you do a sequence of coin flips, you're going to get what? Heads, 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 infinitely, right? And according to the rules of the game, you'll never decide if player 1 or player 2 wins. What we can say from this is that given determinism, you cannot, can never extract randomness. But given a little bit of randomness, you can always extract p 
pure randomness, right? Let's suppose uh, this is if like the probability if the probabilities were one and zero, right? Well, let's say the probabilities were very small. Let's say they were like uh, I don't know, uh, one over a hundred and ninety nine over a hundred, right? Very very biased, but per importantly not deterministic. Let's say they were very very small odds of getting a heads, but never zero. You flip the coin in sequence, you're going to get tails, tails, tails. Eventually, though, you keep flipping the tails this way, you are guaranteed if you do a process infinitely and there are, is a small chance of something occurring, it must occur. So you will eventually get a heads. Right? Now, you either get a heads, tails, or a tails, heads. It doesn't matter. But what this basically means, it takes you like 100 coin flips to extract one bit of randomness. So in fact, as a function of uh, how biased your coin is, you can determine how much randomness you can extract. That's why this is called a randomness extractor. So the worse your randomness is, the more, the less random it looks, the harder it is to extract true randomness from it. And in fact, when there's no randomness, you can extract nothing out of it. But given even a little bit of randomness, you can always extract some true randomness, right? Um, randomness extractors are, are everywhere. And this is not how they work on like the computer or anything. But there are all kinds of ways to deal with bias using such methods, right? This is called the von Neumann extractor, right? Anytime you want to flip a coin, heads or tails or something, you could play this game instead if you didn't trust the coin. Because some people do have coins that are not weighted in a certain way, but they're double sides on each head. Actually, this wouldn't work for that situation, but you know. Um, questions on this? OK. Um, this is one of the applications of uh, randomness. I think it explains a lot about like the, the way we interact with randomness. Um, let's do another example. Have you heard of the birthday paradox? The birthday paradox, unlike most paradoxes, is actually not really a paradox. The birthday paradox is a calculation error or a surprising calculation result of, of how uh, many people are needed in a room to guarantee a certain event occurs, which is that two people share a birthday. So let's suppose we're not dealing with probability theory. How many people do you need to have in a room to guarantee that two share a birthday? 367. This year's a leap year. Why is it 367? That's pigeonhole principle. By pigeonhole principle, if you have 367 people in a room and there's 366 days, two people must share a birthday. Now suppose you didn't, you wanted to compute a slightly weaker problem. You don't want to compute the probability that two people share a birthday. You wanted to compute the probability th that given n people in a room that they share a birthday with half chance. So you want to compute some number n such that greater than or equal to than two people share a birthday, right? This is a weakening of the problem. You only want half chance that given among n people, they share a birthday. Now, it is guaranteed at n equals 367 people, does the probability become 1, right? 366 people doesn't mean that the probability is 1 because they can, there, is a, there is an outcome where they're all on a different day. But 300... But let's suppose you want to compute a number of people such that you only have a half chance, you know, 50-50, that two people among n share a room. The paradox derives from the fact that this n is surprisingly small, right? Um, the way we're going to compute this probability is we're going to compute the complement. So we're going to compute uh, 1 minus the probability. And what should the probability of the, the complement of the comp What is the complementary event in human words? Yeah. So we have among n people, we have no shared birthday. We want to compute that probability. And then we'll take 1 minus that probability to get 1 half. In fact, if this is 1 half, then this is 1 half too, right? 1 minus 1 half is 1 half. So we'll just compute this one. Um, now let's consider that you have n people, and they come into uh, everything, of course, permutation, not a combination. You have n people. So suppose they come in one at a time. And then we consider the probability 
of that person having uh, a shared birthday with uh, the previous people in the room. So let AI be, be the event person I shares birthday with uh, people uh, 1 to I minus 1, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to have the people walk into the room one at a time compute the, and compute the product of these events, right? What is the probability? And it's, of course, assume that each person's birthday is independent. So we're simply going to compute the probability, the product of the probabilities of these occurring. What is the probability that the first person shares a birthday with those previous? Does not share a birthday with those previous? Trick question here, but let's see. Yes. Was like three hundred sixty-seven minus like the previous number. How many people are in the room, though? You have n people walking into a room one at a time. The first person walks in. How many people are in the room before him? N people. Well, let's say you have n people in line. And there's an empty room. The first person walks into the room. How many people were in the room before him? Zero. Zero. So what is the probability he shares a birthday with any of the number of people in the room before him? Zero. Yeah. So the probability that his birthday is, is, not, is shared by anyone in the room is zero. So the probability of AI so far should be 365 over 365, right? I think I've missed a compliment somewhere. Doesn't share. Yeah. Now, the first person is in the room. The second person walks in the room. What is the probability that they share a birthday with the first person? What is the probability, I'll say, that they don't share a birthday with the first person? One over That's the probability they do share a birthday with the first person. My mistake for wording it confusingly. What is the probability they don't share a birthday with the first person? Three, six, six. Let's suppose we're not in a leap year, just so I can make my math easier. 365. Yeah. What is the probability the second guy walks in the, the, and shares a birthday with the, the third guy walks in? What is the probability he shares a birthday with either of the two people? He does or doesn't? Does not. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah. Does not share a birthday with the, either of the two people. Given that they don't share a birthday with each other. 363 over 365. Yeah. You're going to keep computing this product n times, and you want to find out what this n is. So we may write this probability generically as the product of uh, 365 minus n minus 1 over uh times 1 over 365 to the n, where i is equal to 1 to, let's say i here, to some n, right? You compute the product of these probabilities, and you have now some number here. You want to know what, what uh, n does this equal, right? 365 over 365 times 364 over 365. Now, here is not some deep math here. You simply just do the brute force calculation of n. And it ends up that the last term for this to be, uh, uh, this is, if n is equal to 23, then this is equal to 0 0.49, approximately, 0 0.490 something, OK? If you have 23 people in a room, then the probability none of them share a birthday is going to be 0 0.49. Now, then what is the probability if you have n, peop uh, if you have n people in a room to share a birthday, with half chance, is going to be uh, two sh the probability to share a birthday is going to be uh, one minus the probability none share, 
And we have the probability none share is equal to 0 0.49 for n is equal to 23. So we know this is going to be 0 0.51, right? Approximately 0 0.50 something decimal, right? Uh, it turns out, like, th the reason this is a paradox, 23 people is surprisingly small. You only need 23 people in a room to be 50-50 odds that two people share a birthday. There's only eight... 12, 13 people in this room right now. So we're not even close. But you could probably estimate this for a given 13 people, what's the probability to share a birthday? You know, it's going to be like, um, uh, I don't know, maybe a quarter or something. So there's a quarter chance that of the people in this room, two of you share a birthday. Now, if we were to do the calculation for a birthday month, how many people do you need to guarantee that, like with probability one, that two people share a birthday? 13 by pigeonhole. Now, I think the number, like, given a certain number of people, how many do you need to guarantee that two share a, bir two share a birthday month with half probability? I think it's like five, right? So you only need five people. If you have five people in a room, assuming birthdays are uniformly distributed, uh, and they're not, everyone for some reason is born in September. There's like a, it's, it's a very biased month. But the probability that two share a birthday, uh, a birthday month, a birthday month is one half if you only have five or six people. Very, very surprising things. It, it turns out, like, the reason this is, this is true, here's a, here's a different version of this problem. Um, what is the probability that two people, uh, among the people in this room, one of you shares a birthday with me? Let's suppose, if, if you have n people, what is the probability that someone shares a birthday with me? This is a challenge question. Um, no, I don't think that's it, because that could be greater than 1. It should be a probability. Where n is um, the number of people. Yes. Let's fix what, oh, here's what I'm trying to say. The probability, the, the, we don't know, it's sort of non-constructive in the sense we don't know what birthday that these two people share. But we know that they, there's a half chance that two people do, among them do share a birthday. There are far more possible birthdays there than if we fix a birthday. Let's, and let's say, ask the question, how many people are, bur are born, given n people, what's the probability, uh, how many people do you need to guarantee with half chance that one of them is born on January 1st? That is a very different question, and the answer to that question is not 23. Right? I think you need 200 something. And that's a much bigger number. And the reason for that is because you fix the date. If you fix the date, the probability that someone matches that date is much smaller than the probability that any pair have share a date, right? And the wording in that question is why, why it's called a paradox, because it sounds like, oh, has this birthday versus share a birthday. There's a very subtle difference. But the probability, the probability between those two events changes drastically. Right? So if you have, like, for example, like a hash function or something, the probability of a collision occurring is much smaller than the probability of a specific collision occurring, right? Probably two things match up at all is much smaller, it's much larger than the probability of something matching to something else specifically. Any questions on the birthday paradox? I have one more uh, interesting example, and then we'll get on to payoff and expectation. Do you guys, have you guys heard of the Monty Hall problem? Like a Vsauce understanding of this problem? Back in the 70s, like we wanted to flex on how much better capitalism was, so one thing the Soviet Union never had was game shows. So we would have game shows where we would get up and we would give people uh, things. There was this Monty Hall game show uh, where you had three doors. OK. And I think this is like the end round thing. I don't think people are just going up to the three doors. And now behind two of the, go two of the doors is guaranteed to be a goat. OK. You have a goat. And then behind one of the doors is a car. Okay, you have three doors. You have two goats, two goats, and one one car. Here's how the way the game is played. There's you, and then there's Monty. Okay. Monty uh, will allow you to pick a door. He says, "Pick a door." He doesn't open the door, but he says, "Pick a door." The door is closed. You pick a door, and you and you hold on to that door. Let's say you pick this one. Okay. Then. What he does is Monty knows which doors have which cars, okay? 
uh, which door has a goat and which door has a car. What he does is he's going to reveal to you a door that has a goat, guaranteed to have a goat. Then he's going to allow you to switch your choice. Do you want to switch to the other door that remains closed, or do you want to stay on your door, right? So the Monty Hall, uh, if you chose, chose a door randomly, what's the probability that you win, that you get a car? 20%. Yeah. What's the probability that you uh, win uh, given that you stay, like you do not switch? What's the probability you get a car given that you do not flip your answer? Yeah. Now here's, a, here's, a, here's the, the Monty Hall, why it's called the Monty Hall problem. What's the probability you win given that you flip? Two -thirds. It's two-thirds. Now when this came out, everyone was shocked and horror, horrified because this goes against very natural intuition. You should be asking, why is that two-thirds? You know? What's the probability that I win given that I flip my answer? Here's the reasoning behind it. Uh, the, uh, the probabilities are never fixed. The probability is a measure of your uncertainty about something, and the uncertainty about something is allowed to change given access to more information. And in fact, given the information here is the fact that Monty will open a door for you, is so much information that your odds increase to two-thirds. In fact, you're, here's, an, here's an, another misformulation of the problem. It's two-thirds. It's not one-half. Let's suppose Monty opened the door before you got to choose. What would be the probability you win then? One half. One half. But the fact that Monty opens the door after you choose means that your probability is two thirds. That sounds like a surprising difference because those events sound like they should be independent, right? The probability you, ch you choose a door and then he opens a door, they sound like they're independent, but they're actually not because Monty is guaranteed to open a door, one, that you did not choose, and two, that contains a goat. So the door that Monty opens is a dependent event upon the door that you chose. Let's work out the math. Let's suppose you always choose door one. Okay. Let's consider all possible outcomes. Now there's more outcomes, but let's suppose you always choose door one. There, there, the outcomes are, let's say, goat, goat, car, goat, car, goat, and car, goat, goat. Okay. Let's say you always choose door one. Just doors are labeled whatever. They're permutations, okay? Let's say you choose door one. Monty will open door two, okay? If you stay and you chose door one and the permutation was goat, goat, car, you lose, right? Let's say the permutation was goat, car, goat. You choose door one. Monty chooses door three. You choose to stay. You like your door. It's lucky. You lose. Let's, let's suppose you choose a car. Monty opens either door two or do door three. With, it doesn't matter which one he picks. He opens either door two or door three. What's the probability you win? Do you win? Stay, yes. Yes. Now let's say uh, Monty, you, you, it's goat, goat, car, and you are determined to flip. You choose door one, Monty will open door two for you, and you flip. Do you win? Yes. Let's say you, it's goat, car, goat, and you choose door one. Monty will then open door three for you, Do you and you choose to flip. Do you win? Let's say you chose a car. Monty will open either door two or door three. Let's suppose door three without loss of generality and you choose to flip, do you win? No. So if you choose the stay strategy, you have a one-third odd of winning. If you choose the win strategy, you have a two-third odd of winning. That is really contrary to the way we interact with uh, randomness, you know? But given uh, what the probability that you win, given that the probability you, you flip is equal to what? If you flip and you win, that means what was it before? If you flipped your answer and you win, what was you had a losing answer before, right? So what is the probability? The probability that you win, given that you flip, is actually equal to the probability you chose a goat on the first round. 
right? If you choose the, the flipping strategy, you win pro with probability that you chose a goat in the first round. If you're determined to flip, uh, you hope that you'll get one of the two goats when you choose. Because you know Monty's going to get rid of the other goat for you, meaning that there's probably a car there. So with two-thirds chance, you hope you get a goat so that Monty eliminates the other goat, so you have to get the car. So the probability that you win is equal to the probability that you were supposed to lose. So you want to lose, so then when you flip, you'll win. It's a Monty Hall problem. It goes contrary to a lot of uh, the way we think about randomness. And when this, there was an article that came out about this in like the 60s or 70s, and people were very upset. People were like, actually, you're wrong. You did the probability. Uh, you know, Whatever you, you did here, someone did this basic calculation and showed that the probabilities work this way. Um, no, it's like uh, it, it is totally contrary to the way we worked, and only and some people were only convinced after they saw a computer simulation of it. But I guarantee, if you do a computer simulation of this event, you will uh, uh, you will win with two thirds chance. In fact, let's play it a little bit. Okay, I'm going to randomly assign three objects to the doors. Okay. Um, all right, you guys, pick a door one, two, or three. Hold on, let's say you win, and let's say you lose. Let's do some, let's do six games, okay? You pick door two, okay? I'm gonna open door one. Do you flip? Mm, yes. Okay, uh, you win. Uh, let's say, I, I, I just memorized a permutation. I haven't proven to you that, I, that I've memorized a permutation. Let's say, uh, okay, I'm gonna scramble it again, pick a door. Three. Three? OK, I'm going to open door two. Do you flip? Yes. OK, um, let's, I've scrambled it again. Someone open a door? One. One. I'm going to open door three. Do you flip? No. no. Well, you do lose. Well, we're trying to do the flipping strategy. If you chose not to flip, I'm going to put you over here. OK, uh, I've scrambled it again. Someone open a door? Three. You open door three. I'm going to open door two. Do you choose to flip or no? Flip. flip? Uh, you win. OK, actually, we have 100% so far. It's not too good. Um, I've scrambled it again. Someone open a door? Two. two. I open door one. Do you flip? Yes. Uh, you win. OK. Um, this is not looking like two thirds. This is looking like 100% chance. Let's just do two more. Let's do two more, OK? Law, law of large numbers means it should converge to the average. It should converge to two thirds. It doesn't mean you get two thirds of a car. It means with two thirds chance, if you play the game 100 times, you'll, 66 of those times, you'll get the car, OK? Let's do, one, let's do two more. Um, uh, OK, I've scrambled it. Someone open a door? Two? OK. I open door one. Do you flip or stay? Finally, OK. <laughs> we'll do one more time. Um, you scramble it. OK, someone choose a door. One. OK, you choose door one. Do you choose, uh, with, do, I'll open door two. Do you choose to stay? Flip. You lose again, actually. I chose door one that time. So Lucky that it worked out four out of six times on that, on the last two. If you flip a coin infinitely many times, with, with very low probability, will you get a sequence of, of tail? Of, Tails, right? It'll converge to what the mean is supposed to be. So this, when you say the probability of an event is two thirds, it does not mean you get two thirds of a car. It means two thirds chance out of a hundred times or something. Uh, for very large numbers, does it converge to that value? So that's the Monty Hall problem. F fascinating thing. And again, one of those things that you could probably learn through like Vsauce level. This is one of those mathematical games that children uh, enjoy. So any questions on the Monty Hall problem? Anyone unconvinced that it's two thirds probability and not one half probability? People think it's one half probability because you have, a, after Monty eliminates a door, there are only two doors left, and he eliminates a door with a goat. So you think it, you would think that there's one door with one goat and one door with one car. So a, a worse calculation of this, like a wrong calculation, is to assume that 50 50, you know, one goat, one car, two doors. I'm, I, I flip where I stay. But the thing is, Monty is only going to open the door with the goat in it that you didn't pick. That's why it becomes two thirds. Right? Kind of crazy that this works. Questions on this? All right, let's do expectations and payoffs. Um, it's not a 
availability going to be on the exam? Yeah, that'll be a question on the exam. Um, a random variable is a function uh, which maps. We should, usually we'll do events like A and B, and we'll do random variables like X and Y. A random variable is a function which maps outcomes to values. You can think of a random variable as a payoff function. Given a certain outcome, you earn a certain reward. You earn a certain amount of money. Something is paid to you. It's a payoff function. A random variable is neither random nor a variable. It's a function. And now this confuses everybody because it's not random. It's not a variable. But it is a payoff function. For example, let's say uh, we had heads and tails. And we had uh, a random variable heads is equal to 1. And then uh, tails is equal to negative 1. Right? What this basically means, like in terms of like a word problem or something, the ra let x be the random variable such that if you get heads, I will pay you a dollar. And if you get a tails, you pay me a dollar, right? This is what we would call uh, the random variable, uh, the, a random variable, right? It's a payoff. It's an expected amount of something, something to occur. So maybe perhaps a certain number of times of something or a certain value earned is usually like, in terms of gambling, it's the amount that you will earn, right? Um, expectation of a random variable is basically a generalization of the idea of a mean, the concept of a mean. It's a weighted average. So it's an average of the outcomes that you'll earn. So in finite probability theory, we de de denote it as the outcome, the payoff of x of of, of outcome omega i times the probability that that outcome occurs. Again, so pi is the probability that outcome omega i occurs. And x of omega i is the money you make or lose if outcome, I, if outcome omega i occurs. So the sum of the, prob the product of the probabilities is simply, um, this is basically the average of your possible outcomes, weighted by what the probability of those outcomes is. If we're playing this game where you flip a coin and you give me a dollar if it's a heads, uh, no, I give you a dollar if it's heads, and you give me a dollar if it's tails, what is the expectation of this specific game? And x here is expectation, the expected amount that you will earn playing this game. Yeah. We're going to have 1 half times 1 plus 1 half times negative 1, which is equal to 1, minus, 1 half minus 1 half, which is 0. So in fact, if you play this game, you ex play this game, the expectation that you'll earn is a zero. That kind of makes sense. If the coin is 50-50, 50-50, you play, you give a dollar, you lose a dollar, you gain a dollar, you lose a dollar. Uh, with 50-50 odds, does nothing happen ever, right? Now, this doesn't mean that uh, you will definitely earn something, uh, or you definitely will lose something. But it does say you're expected not to do it. So in fact, your choice of whether or not to play the game or not doesn't really matter. Because were you to play the game a, a sufficient number of times, there you will, uh, the, the expected payoff that you'll earn is nothing. So it's as easy as not playing, right? Suppose that you roll a die, and I will pay you uh, a, dollar, or a dollar if you roll a one, two dollars if you roll a two, and so on, right? So in here, our random variable x of omega i is going to be equal to i, right? I'll pay you that money that you roll on the side. What is the expectation of this random variable then, if you roll a die? How much are you expected to earn? The sum of all the numbers divided by 6. Which is what? Six. Which is what? 350. Yeah. So it's, if you play this game, you're expected to earn three and a half dollars. Now, so you play the game, you're expected to earn three and a half dollars. Uh, not that if you play the game any number of times, you play the game one time, you're expected to earn three and a half dollars. Uh, now, do you, now, Here's what the expectation means. It doesn't mean that you do earn three and a half dollars. It just means you're expected to earn three and a half dollars. 
You could earn more than that, and you could earn less than that. But the expectation is positive. So you're going to make some money. You know, with, you're expected to make some money. Another thing to notice, 3 and a half is none of the values between 1 and 6. It's not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. But it is the expected payoff. So sometimes the expectation may not literally be an event itself. That's kind of important. You know, like, um, and this is one of those things that averages uh, can tell you, which may not really make any sense. For example, the average of a zebra, if you're describing a zebra, a zebra to a friend who's blind at the zoo for some reason, and you tell him, well, on average, it's gray, that's not a very good description of what the zebra is, right? So sometimes the mean of a data set doesn't communicate anything about it effectively. It, it's outliers or anything like this. Here, one of the values is not even an element of the, of the set, right? Um, if we flip a coin, and it, it's a, if you get a heads, you get a dollar. And if, it's get a, if you get a tails, you get nothing. What's the expectation of a random bit? Yeah, so the expectation of a random bit is one half, but one half is not a bit either way, right? So sometimes the expectation doesn't make sense classically if you think this way, but you should you know, grow your brain a little bit and try to think like, I know it's not one of the values, but it's the expected payoff that I'm, I'm supposed to earn right, for this. Um, okay, let's say you, uh, there's a guy, he's a homeless man, and he offers you a game, maybe he's a wizard. You have a biased coin, and you have a heads or a tails. And he knows the coin is biased, and so do you. And he knows that the heads occurs 8 out of, eight out of 10, 8 out of 9 times, and tails occurs 1 out of 9 times, okay? And he's really, really determined for, him to give you, for you to give him $100. He really wants $100. So he's going to play this game with you where he says, let's flip the coin. If it's a heads with 8 and 9 probability, I, you have to give me $100. Um... So the outcome, uh, the expected, uh, excuse me, the x of omega heads, we'll say x of heads, is going to be you lose $100, right? But he's so determined to get $100, he's going to pay you whatever you ask if you get a tails. But he doesn't care because he's so certain that you're not going to get a tails. We want to know what price should you ask from him if you get a tails. He'll, he's willing to say yes to anything because he's so certain you're going to pay him $100 that uh, he's willing to pay you anything because he knows he won't have to pay you. But if we, set the expect, if we set the payoff high enough, we can make it worth our money. How much money should we charge to play the game? How much money should we, we, we should ask from him if we get a Tails to make the game fair? 800. 800. Why? Because that's the... Uh, it's the expectation. Let's do an expectation of X to be like... Um, we have, with eight and nine odds, we're going to lose $100, okay? And uh, with some tiny value, let's say Y, we're going to gain some money. So for what Y is the expectation greater than zero? We want to have an expected value to be we don't enter debt. We make money. So we'll say the, what, for what Y is the expectation of this greater than zero? And then here we may simply solve for y. So we're going to get n 0 is uh, greater than negative 800 over 9 plus y over 9. And from here you can see that y, uh, we multiply both sides by 9. We're going to get that y must be greater than 800. right? So every dollar that we ask above 800, if we're saying give me $900, we have a ex positive expected payoff. So in fact, even if our odds are lower of winning, the expectation is still pretty high. Now, practically, you always have to remember that uh, the expectation of a random variable is one assuming like something, an outcome occurs many times, and you take the average of certain, a certain number of trials or something like this. So if you're playing one game one time, I, don't, I would not be willing to play the game uh, to lose $100, uh, even though I have a one-ninth chance of uh, earning the $800, because... That still has expectation of zero, right? I'm, I'm not, that, and it only becomes, it only makes it fair after you play like a million trials or something, right? Um, Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin block works like the the probability that you earn a reward is proportional to the hash power. It's it's proportional to the amount of compute that you contribute to 
uh, this solving this puzzle. If you contribute 1% uh, of the total power of the network, the compute power of the network to solving this puzzle, you have a 1% chance of earning the 10-minute the prize. There's a prize every 10 minutes. I'm trying to oversimplify and explain how Bitcoin works, right? But the thing is, um, if your probability, if, your ha if the compute power you contribute to this game is so small, you can compute the expected number of 10-minute intervals that have to pass before you get a single payout. And then it's like, you know, you'll get your first payout in a million years, something like this. So if you're a small uh, person contributing a very small amount of compute, even though you have proportional expected payout, like as anyone else does, proportional to your compute power, the chance, the, the, the expected number of trials of you getting a block, is, uh, getting a reward is so small that it, it's, you have to do other strategies. So what happens is these miners, what we'll say is they pool together their resources and they act as one larger player. And then that has a larger, a, 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 a better chance of finding blocks and then they pay out individually to the miners, something like this. So even if the game, you know, the expectation is, is such as it is, it's only dependent upon basically a limit of n. You take the limit of it. And for small things, it's maybe not even worth it. Right? Questions on this? Expectation? OK, let's suppose we want to compute the expected, number of the expected number of times it takes to roll a die on a certain side. right? So we want to compute not like a payoff of something, but the expected number of times an event has to repeat before something occurs. right? So we want to roll a die and ask ourselves, what's the expected number of times that uh, an event occurs? Right? So what we're going to do is take a summation. So we want to compute, um, you roll a die. What is the expected number of times, expected number of rolls to get a six. What do we think it is? Six. Yeah, if you roll a die six times, it's expected you get a six. This doesn't mean you get a six. If you roll a die six times, you can get one, 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 right? It's, not, it's never promised, but it is uh, hopeful. So what we're going to do is just compute the probability that you get a six for each uh, roll. What is the probability? Um, what is the probability? Uh, you get a six on the first roll. One six. Yeah. Okay. Now, what is the probability you get a six on the second roll? Um. It's equal to the probability you get a six on the second roll, but you only get to the second roll if you did not get a six on the first roll. The second roll only occurs if the first roll was not a six. So we may say, what is the probability of A2, where A2 is the second roll, given the fact that the first roll was not a six. Um, five, six, ten, one, six. Exactly. Now, what is the probability that the third roll is a six, given that the first roll was not a six, and that the second roll was not a six? Now, this is a new notation. You can condition on many such events. Right? Several things occur. You can condition. We do, a, we do the bar. This is read as A3. What is the probability of A3 given A1 complement, A2 complement? Right? What is this? 5, 6 times 5, 6 times 1, 6. Why are, they, why are we multiplying it this way? Isn't conditional probability we're supposed to take the intersection divided by the, the, the other ones? They're independent. Each roll of the die is independent from the previous rolls. The only thing that's not independent is the number of rolls, because the nth roll only occurs if the n minus one rolls were something that we know, right? So in fact, what you do is you take this, you take the infinite summation of this, and you're, you're going to get i is equal to one to infinity of. It's going to be one sixth times one minus one sixth, which is five sixths to the i minus 1. We'll say i is equal to 0. The i, OK? Do we agree that this is our, uh, pro this is the, expecta the expected number of rolls we'll have to do, right? 
Now, there is a world out there. Unfortunately, you have to take this summation to infinity because there's a, there is a chance out there that you roll, as, you roll a 1, you roll a 1, you roll a 1, you roll a 1, 10,000 times in a row. And only on the 10,001 time do you get a 6. And unfortunately, that has to be factored into our probability. right? So this is just going to be uh, 1 sixth times the sum of i is equal to 0 to infinity of uh, 5 over 6 to the i. Does anyone remember what this, what this is? Does anyone remember the name of a summation, an infinite summation like this? So one more time. P series. P series. I don't, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that name. Does this, first of all, this is an infinite summation. It better converge because we're trying to compute an expected number of outcomes of something, number, an expected number of roles. So it better not be infinity. This is a, 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 a convergent summation, definitely, because this is less than one, right? Does it, is it a geometric series? This is a geometric series. Does anyone remember the closed form of the geometric series? I'll prove it to you in a second, but let's see if you remember. Yeah, it's it's going this is going to be 1 6 times w 1 over 1 minus 5 6. Okay. What is 1 minus 5 6? What is 1 over 1 6? So we, we get 6 over 6 which is 1, right? Excellent. I think I messed up on the calculation here. It's supposed to be 6. I don't think I was supposed to multiply through by the 1 6 as a conditional probability. I'm considering the events. The number of expected rolls is n such that the first one was not a 6, the second one was not a 6, the third one was not a 6, but then the fourth one was a 6, something like this. And then we compute for what n are we expected to get this. And then we won't have this 1 6 multiplied here. It'll just be 1 over 1, 1 over 1 6, which will be 6. Right. Let me prove to you the closed form of the geometric series. Right. We want to prove that the summation of i is equal to 0 uh, to infinity of, let's say, r to the i is equal to 1 over 1 minus r, where r must be between 0 and 1. Right. This is something we can prove pretty easily. And we're going to use it. The reason I want to, I want to prove this is because I think it's cool. I have never remembered, committed, committed to memory, the closed form of the geometric series. Every time I need it, I just reprove it because it's, it's easy. And that's why I think this is a great proof. If we write a summation like this, we're going to get um, 1 plus, let's say we're trying to compute some value y, such that y is equal to 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed plus dot, dot, dot. And given that r is less than 1, we need to guarantee that the summation converges. Now, we're going to do something illegal in a second. You are not allowed to arbitrarily move around math terms in an infinite summation and group them according to certain patterns. But I'm going to do it anyway because it makes the proof correct. So what do we know about 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed? Let's undistribute an r from the first, uh, from all terms except the 1. We're going to get this is equal to 1 plus r times 1 plus r plus r squared plus, right? Do we agree? What is 1 plus r plus r squared plus dot, dot, dot? Yeah, so we're going to get that y is equal to 1 plus ry. So we have an infinite summation. Within that infinite, infinite summation, literally inductively, recursively, exists the same infinite summation. We're simply going to get uh, this formula. And then if you solve for y, you're, you're going to take y minus ry is equal to 1. And then you're going to undistribute the y. And from there, I'll leave it to you sh to, to work that y is equal to 1 over 1 minus r. Questions on this? All 
All right, I have one more example for, for you, and then I'm going to do a proof on, actually, I'll just do the proofs instead on expectation of random variables. If we have two random variables, it turns out that the sum of random variables is always defined to be a random variable. If, again, a random variable you should think of as a payoff function. If you have some kind of payoff function, and you have two payoff functions, two random variables, the sum of them is uh, also going to be some sort of payoff, right? Um, what do we think the expectation of x plus y is? Let's say x is the expected number of people in line 1, and y is the expected number of people in line 2. The summation of the expected numbers of people in line 1 and 2 is going to be equal to, what do we think? Expectation of x plus the expectation of y. Yeah, this is the expectation of x, the people in line 1, plus the expectation, expected number of people in line 2. This is called linearity of expectation. Expectation is a linear function. Not every function can be done, it has this property. Linear, linear functions is, in particularly do, but expectation is uh, one that works this way. We have linear, what's called linearity of expectation. Let's prove it. Uh, x plus y, what is x plus y? x plus y is a random variable. These are functions, I'm adding functions. So what I really mean is that x plus y, I can call it some z such that z is a function from uh, omega to, let's say, the reals, such that a z of omega i is equal to x of omega i plus y of omega i. Again, x and y are payoff functions. So y, z is going to be some payoff function. From there, we can compute directly that uh, expectation of x plus y is just going to be the expectation of z which is going to be the sum of i is equal to 1 to capital N of p of i times a z of omega i, which is just equal to um, as we said, this is just going to be equal to i is equal to 1 to n of p of i times x of omega i plus y of omega i. Right? From there, we may simply distribute. We'll get the sum of i is equal to 1 to n of pi x omega i plus pi y omega i. And then we can break the sum up. What is the sum from i equals 1 to n of pi times uh, x omega i? Yes. Similarly, this is just going to be the expectation of y. The expectation of two payoffs is equal to the sum of the expectations of each. Again, whenever given a mathematical theory like this, you should make sure it corresponds to your intuition about what the way the world works. Calculus should correspond to the way your intuition about physics. You know, this corresponds to your intuition about uncertainty, about payoff. You know, um, similarly, the expectation of a x plus b, where um, a comma b are real numbers. What is the expectation of ax plus b we think should be equal to? Let's go back to understanding what a, what a random variable is. A random variable, again, is, <coughs> think of it as a payoff. If x is a random variable that pays you something, x plus b is your payoff, where b is a, an amount that you're guaranteed to already earn, basically, right? That's something that's already been paid off to you, in some sense. So whatever it is, our actual payoff, expectedly, is going to just have a plus b there. And then similarly, by linearity, that a is just going to be exactly what we think. This is, you know, a mathematical theorem that can be written as terms of summations, but it also 
I'm trying to stress that it isn't just pure mathematics. It corresponds to our intuition about uncertainty and payoff, as it should. Right? Um, let's prove it. The expectation of a x plus b is going to be equal to the sum of i equals 1 to n. And I could do the same z trick, but I'll just I'll jump ahead a step. We'll get p of i times a x of omega i plus b. Right? From there, we follow with simple uh, uh, first principles. We're getting the sum of uh, the sum of i equals one to capital N of p i times a x i x of omega i plus b times the sum of i equals one to N of p of i, right? Now. What is the sum of i equals 1 to n of p of i? One. one. Sum of the probabilities of, of, of the sample space is always 1. So we get b times 1, so that's going to be a b. Here, this a is in each term. We simply pull it out. We're left p i times x omega i, which is simply going to be the expectation of x. So this is going to be a expectation of x plus b. QED, right? Linearity of expectation. Questions on this? You can use expectation to calculate your expected payoffs in like certain gambling games or something. And if you, you know, this is why gamblers are um, certainly uh, less intelligent than the rest of us. Because it, you can do, for example, the calculation of craps as a game. And I only bring that up as an example because it's easy to calculate. It's a, basically for every dollar you put into craps, your expected, your, your expected payoff is going to be 98 cents. So for every dollar you invest, you, lose, you, you will only earn 98 cents back. What that means is you net negative 2 cents for every dollar you put in. You have a 2% expected loss for every time, 2% uh, expected loss for how, whatever money you bet on craps, right? Now, if you're talking about investments, if something has a, has a negative 2% payoff, you should not touch that. That sounds like really stupid, right? The stock market, I think, has like an expected 6 or 8% return. Now, how... It always has a six or eight expe expected return, except that one time that it doesn't, and then everyone freaks out. But I mean, in terms of an investment, you should probably go to the stock market instead of the casino. Right. Questions on this? Okay.